Hello, and welcome to the Cotney Attorneys and Consultants Achieving Excellence with Service webinar. My name is Leela Niskis, and I'm a consultant here at Cotney. I've been in the roofing industry for about 14 years now, coming to Cotney from the contractor side of the industry. I'm joined today by my dear friend, John Kenny, who's the CEO at Cotney Consulting. John's been in the industry for over 45 years and has worked for multiple top 100 roofing contractors. John, how are you today? I'm doing great. It's good to be here with you. How are you doing? Good, I'm doing really well. So I'm so excited to talk about this topic of service today because I feel like it's been kind of a buzzword in the industry this last year. And I know with all of your experience and wisdom, especially on the service side of the industry, can you share a little bit of your history? Sure. Well, if you're looking at a picture of my old family company back up in Dover, New Jersey, and this is about the uh, mid 80s, 86, somewhere in that area where you're seeing this photo. And those there are the first two trucks that we actually dedicated to going out. And what at that time we called fixing leaks. All right. Service was not a buzzword, nor do we even understand what it was then. We just knew that when you had a client or a customer call up, you had to go out and fix their leaks. So in the very beginning, of course, you'd work uh, in the roof. And you maybe, <clears throat> excuse me, send your foreman out to run a couple of uh, leaks after work or the next day or on Saturday. So there really was no, uh, no, no, no set system whatsoever. It's just the way it was done. So about mid 80s, I got this idea, sat down with my family. We went through it and said, you know what? I think there's something in fixing leaks, right? We can make money in it. There's high profit. Um, there's more to it than just going out and slapping cement around on a roof. People need to take care of their roofs. They got other work that's got to be done. So we started then what we would have called a service division, but then it was just, you know, we're going up repairs. A lot of times, uh, it's funny, some of the people that have been in the industry a while know we call it patch and repair. That was the old uh, buzzword back then. So yeah. we started to get into it, started tracking it, found out it was very lucrative, and it turned out to be, again, more than just fixing leaks. We learned really about customer service uh, the hard way, you just had Polaroids, you had, uh, you know, a handwritten typewriter or whatever before computers came out. So it was an interesting way, but that's how I really got to start and started building from that point on to what service divisions are or what we know them to be today. Mm -hmm. And I remember in your virtual book signing the other day on Facebook, you mentioned that your grandfather was an inspiration for you. Yes, he was. He started the company in 1924. Um, I was very fortunate to, uh, he was still around when I was up into a teenager and I had a lot of great conversations with him. Um, at the time, you know, being 13 years old, I didn't really understand a lot of them like most other kids, but I knew I wanted to go stay in the roofing business. I love working summers, you know, started there at nine years old all the way up. So yes, he was an inspiration to me and he always drilled into me that you've got to take care of the customer and the customer will take care of you. That's so true. So uh, during this webinar, we're going to do a couple polls for our attendees. And uh, so right now we're going to do our first poll. And we want to know who's with us today. So are you, what kind of contractor are you? Are you a residential contractor? Are you a commercial contractor? Do you do both? Or are you not even a contractor at all? And you just want to listen to us talk about the excellence of service. So I'm going to take a couple of seconds, let you guys fill out this poll. All you got to do is click the button. All right, things are coming in. I'm gonna give it just a couple more seconds. Okay, I'll close the poll in three, two, one. Let's see what we have. Oh, not, not surprising results. Yeah, absolutely. So I believe that says, I don't have my glasses on, so I believe that says 58% commercial, 3% yep. residential, 15 both. Fantastic, so kind of a, mostly commercial crowd today. So welcome to our webinar. We're excited to have you here. Um, so John, I know that with experience comes lessons learned, right? Even in my short time in the industry compared to you, I've had to learn some hard lessons. So can you give our attendees maybe one or two of the lessons that you've learned? And so maybe they won't have to learn those the hard way. Sure. Um, one thing I'd like to say about the crowd that we have on here, we look like we have 3% that are residential only. Service is for both, okay? 
Um, I think there's a huge miss out there in the residential sector for doing service. Um, yes, it may not be a, a proper model if you're going in and doing a small residential area, but it is a great model to get into, especially in the higher end, higher scale neighborhoods where how you know home roofs will go 20, 30,000 and up. Um, I think it's a big miss in the industry, so we're working on that to try to get that out there. So yeah, as far as other lessons learned, um, you know, one of the things we like to go through is, um, you know, how do you how do you model your division, right? Um, so what I mean by that is you have to learn that service needs to be completely separate from every other part of your operations. I know we'll go a little deeper into that later. So how do, how do you find out what's going on out there? So partner with experts in the field. That's always important to do. You want to work with a mentor. You know, if you're new into this, work, work with somebody. There's plenty of people out there that have done this before and have also, um, you know, done what you're trying to do or where you want to be. So that's a great resource. Um, look into organizations, you know, for help, for, for sus, you know, for what you want to do. And, you know, a great source today, especially with the pandemic, uh, we learn to do, like we, everybody that's on here, webinars, podcasts, all that stuff is YouTube. It's all there. Websites, go for it. Learn, learn as much as you can. And, you know, you want to read books. Um, there, you know, books are, are something that's still out there. I know we've kind of gotten away from them, but, you know, audio books, written books, learn. That's the biggest thing. You cannot digest enough information. And that's what I've learned, whether it is a service division or anything else, the more you can gather on the subject and learn from people who have done it before you, the better off that you can be. Yeah. So we're going to throw another poll at you guys right now. And we want to kind of gauge our attendees and where you're at. So it's a simple kind of yes or no poll. Do you have a service division now? or not. So yes, no, or not applicable. And I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to do that. Shouldn't take too long since it's either a yes or a no. <clears throat> okay. So I'll close it in three, two, one. Let's see what we have. Yes, yeah, 50 percent. Oh. Yes, that's fantastic. And 15 percent no and then not applicable so we have we have people on here for informational purposes as well and um so we yeah. look like we're gearing for a, about a fourth a little less than maybe a little less than a fourth a fifth of it that wants to get yeah. into it and the rest has got something going on yeah so you know, that's great you got a great mix of audience happy to have you on absolutely so john you touched on kind of a, a business plan and how would you model your division you talked about partners and, and experts in the industry. You, you touched on listening to podcasts, which is fantastic. So uh, let's talk about now what a contractor would want to get out of it. So what should their end goal be if they have a service division? Sure. Um, first of all, you got to pick, when I say end goal, what do you want to do? You know, you kind of look at it like a mini business plan. Like I said, you need to pick what your target is. Um, try, you know, if, you, if you're new in here, you want to start out worrying about work, getting one truck out there, being able to service with it. Um, usually working in pairs always works best. So this is a commitment that you have to be willing to make. I will tell you, this will not work trying to switch with your people from your other crews out onto this. You need to make the commitment. So be realistic. I mean, your average truck, depending on what marketplace you're in, if you have two guys working, or two, two people, I should say, not guys, that's old school. You got two service people out there working, um, you know, nonstop, 40 hours a week plus, you know, you're going to generate anywhere of 300,000 to five, 600,000 per truck. When you first start out, you're probably going to do about 250. It's just the way it goes to you build up your business. So that you want to set your goal, set a reasonable goal. Don't say I'm going to start out in the business and do two, $3 million my first year, because you're not going to hit it. You're going to get discouraged. So if you are existing the same way, if you're out there, whatever you're doing, you're doing a million, you're doing 2 million, you're doing 5 million, increase your goals up in reasonable steps. Um, you know, what customers are you targeting? Th this is a big mistake that I see all the time. Don't try to be something to everyone. Try to narrow it down to what you do best. If you're best at responding to emergency leaks on hospitals and those type of things, if that's what you're geared for, go for it. Advertise for it, market it towards it. If you want to be a full service, there's nothing wrong with that, but you're going to find you've got crews that are going to be set up to respond to certain things, so set that. The other thing is the financial investment. You have to be willing. You've got to have a dedicated truck, a dedicated team. Then inside, you've got to 
you can share admin staff in the beginning. As you grow, you're going to want to dedicate people towards it. But admin, I always find, is not as hard to do as an initial step to get your trucks and get your people in place out in the field. And, you know, when you get your admin inside, it's, it's fairly easy to train them a customer, well, not easy, but customer service. You want to be customer service focused. That's where it's at. Your whole team, all the way out to the person on the roof, needs to be customer service. That's the key to service. Absolutely. So you kind of touched on uh, a potential target market. And this is something that has come up uh, with a few of our clients recently who are trying to branch out into the service and maintenance world. So what should a contractor do in regards to marketing and sales and reaching their target audience? Because I know when I was a contractor, it could be difficult at times. You're gathering the data, you're looking at close ratios um, for certain lead sources, and that can be daunting. So talk to me a little bit about the marketing and sales of a service division. Sure. Uh, so, you know, it's important that you generate the vision and the, you know, outward bounds to your customers that you want to be. Um, cu customers that use a service, somebody for service are definitely different than a customer that, you know, especially if you're doing GC bid work or anything like that, they're different. They're going to want to feel comfortable, know you're an expert in your field and what you're doing. So you want to target that area of your website. To, to show that you're customer focused, to show that you know how to respond, to show that you understand preventative maintenance and all, all those things that go along with it. Uh, so again, target your audience, remember who you're reaching. If you're going after homeowners, it's a different strategy than if you're going after certain commercial. If you're going after retail, it's a little bit different. So you've got to learn how to target your areas towards it. So I'm sure in your business right now, you are already doing that for other work. So just kind of pinpointing this down. Facebook, LinkedIn, social media, I will tell you those are key for service. Um, you got to be doing some videos. You got to be mixing it up. You got to get some written articles out there. You got to have information and don't always make it about how great you are. Get that information out. Customers, clients, they love to be educated. The more education that you can show as a contractor, the more they're going to look at you as the expert. And they're also going to look at your Google reviews. So make sure you manage them very carefully because one bad Google review can knock you out of the ballpark. So make sure you do get reviews, make sure they're managed, that you're getting good reviews and follow up with your customers. Um, you know, most people don't have in-house marketing. So you've got to have someone in your company that understands this magic world of SEO and pay-per-click and all those other good things that go along with it. Those are very, you know, I call them the mystery of the industry. I have a hard time with them myself, but they're very, very valuable to get you up as far as reaching the customer base you want. Find someone good to work with to do that. Um, and sanitize your text to get more reviews. You know, you want to be able to put them on some sort of an incentive plan. I love doing this when I was on the contracting side. You want to give them incentive to do their job to the absolute best. I know that sounds crazy while I'm already paying them. But no one really, you know, everyone gets paid to perform a job, but you want to incentivize them to be the expert at what they do and to go that extra mile for your customers. And, you know, those are those are great ways of doing it. Yeah. And what would you say, you know, how much should somebody spend on their marketing budget every year? What would you say? Well, I, you know, again, you know, industry, if you look through the standards, they tell you 10 percent of your sales. I, I've never really bought into that's a good standard but i i doubt you're if you had a poll on that i doubt most of the contractors that on this webinar spend anywhere near that um usually what i look at if you can if you can carve out anywhere between two and four percent of your overall targeted revenue you usually can put a decent program together to get you there yeah that's good to know so go with me here john so let's say i'm a contractor i'm i'm a commercial contractor who's on our webinar right now I put together my business plan. We talked about a strategy. I've spent dollars on marketing and sales. So I'm getting leads, I'm signing contracts. Who's actually doing the work? Talk to me about building my winning team. Well, the way to build your team again, like I said, is have dedicated team to do it. Um, I will say in today's world, which is different from when I first started, someone on your two person team really should be tech savvy. Um, I know that sounds crazy to uh, to a point, but it you know fixing the leak is a small part of what you do. Um, I do 
sometimes you hear out there that it's not about fixing leaks. Well, it certainly is. If you can't perform that basic part of the service, it doesn't matter what else you do. People aren't going to have you back. But you don't want to make that the only thing you do. So you want to be good at what you do. I assume you're on this webinar. You're a great roofer. You're out there doing your thing every day, and you, and you know you can take care of it. That's that's part A. Part two is you want to you got to have technology today. I know we're going to get to that a little bit later, but you want to make sure that you're someone out of that crew. Maybe maybe you got the great leak fixer that as part A, and part B is your technology person. So that's what I recommend for that. And you know repair get down to the difference repair techs you know they have the fix it mindset so when you start to develop into this you're going to have some people on your team that are the best leak tracers and fixers that are out there that's great that's okay you're still going to probably do 40 to 50 percent of your business is going to be emergency response you know that's part of the job mm -hmm. then the rest of it you want to really move in to being able to develop that uh, service aspect team that's able to go out and work with the customer develop business right on the job site, preventative maintenance, post-maintenance, pre-maintenance, all that goes along with it. So they need to be more service oriented. So in other words, they have to be, uh, you know, to the next level up, just going out and tracing leaks, but you still will need that, you know, that go get or leak tracer person. That's important. Mm -hmm. So I know we have some people who do both residential and commercial who are on this webinar today. Would you suggest that they have different techs do steep slope and different techs do low slope? Or would you suggest they have the same tech do both and learn both sides of that business? Well, on that part of it, it depends on your business mix, right? So if you, you know, there, there are plenty of roofers out there that are just as capable both of knowing all the low slope aspects as a steep slope. Um, you know, a lot of people are trained that way. But if you if you've got a tech that only knows low slope, don't send them out on a steep slope, right? <laughs> so right. that that's what, so that more comes into the mix of your company. Ultimately, if you can train your service people to be able to fix all types of roof systems, the better off you will be. But that's not always the case. The larger you get, it's okay to have people more specialized in certain areas. But when you start out, you're probably going to want the, you know your first truck to be able to handle almost anything that comes in. They're very talented or you've got to limit what you're doing in the beginning. Yeah. So you've so you've touched base, you know, throughout this webinar on customer service and how important it is. And from my experience, customer service is critical when it comes to a repair and maintenance division because if a contractor gets a call out for repair, does the repair with excellent customer service, sometimes that's the best marketing because they'll get called out again when there's a potential, you know, full re-roof opportunity at that same job. So talk to me about the importance of giving excellent service to customers and how that can bring them more business. Sure. I mean, the whole goal of this, so there's a couple of ways of going. I know I've, I've worked with some people recently that are really planning on being almost full service only companies. And then if they get into a re-roof situation, they, they will have a partner to do it. And, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But the majority, especially since I see a lot of commercial contractors on here, you are probably going to want, you've got, you've already got your crews, you're doing your work. So you, you want to fill your pipeline. This service, excellent service in, in repairing the leaks properly, treating the customer properly, backing up what you say you're going to do, right time response, and most importantly, tell the truth. That I can't get that across enough in any part of the business and roofing. Be honest. If you can't do something, tell them why you can't do it. Tell them when you can be there. 95% of the time, they're going to be okay with it. But if they catch you in that lie, especially your roofers in the field, make sure that they don't pass on information that is incorrect. So that will lead, fill your pipeline. That's going to lead to re-roof. So the ultimate goal at a service is to have that golden cash coming in in the beginning because a majority of service work should turn you, you know, T&M can be a 50 margin because you're doing time and material, it's harder. But once you start getting more into preventive maintenance and getting into, you know, uh, putting out quotes for maintenance work on projects and stuff like that, you know, you're up to 60, 70% turnover in, in GP all the time. So that's a great way to fund your company and stay ahead but more importantly, now the customer learns trust with customer service. When it comes time for the re-roof, the ultimate goal is to either limit who your competition is, have the driver's seat, or it happens at times that you're the only one that they go to to put a roof on the building. 
So that's why all of this matters all the way up. Yeah. And I mean, I remember when I was a contractor, reviews were so important to us. Um, what could a bad review do to a contractor? I know you, you touched on it a little bit before, but what could it do to a contractor? Well, more importantly than the actual review that ends up on, this, on the website is you get a bad review immediately from the customer, you probably won't even know it. They're all of a sudden going to drop you. Somebody else is going to be out there. And by the time you, if you're not following through with good customer service practices, you know, whether it's through software you have to notify them, you want to do follow-up calls. You still have to have the human touch. Everything just can't be electronic. You want to follow through. Hey, how was it? You know, we were out there last week. Everything okay? You know, and document. The customer will be gone before you even realize they've left you. And that's the worst thing that can happen because it starts to be a snowball effect. So, you know, you've really got to keep a close eye on what's happening throughout your organization, especially on service. Service is, you got one shot at it. Um, they can, you can get away with not fixing the leak. What I mean by that is sometimes there's other areas that leak. People understand that. But rudeness, not showing up on time, overcharging, anything that comes on poor customer service, they'll leave you because they're paying a premium for you to take care of their business. Yeah, it's a very good point. So, uh, John, we know that successful roofing service businesses understand that a winning combination of, you know, cost-effective marketing that we've talked about, superior technical training, and, you know, this corporate mindset that promotes excellent customer service is a must for success. So what I want to do now is kind of switch gears a little bit um, and talk about roof survey techs and the importance of using technology to separate your company from the competition. And, you know, one of the things that I keep getting questions on is, is there really a difference between a roof inspection and a roof survey? Do I have to provide both? And, and so, John, can you tell me what the differences are between the two and why they're so important to have? Yeah, for sure. That's a great question. Um, and, and there is a difference. Um, probably most people don't realize the difference. You know, I need my roof inspected. You know, or, you know nobody's going to call you and say, I need my roof survey. But here's a basic difference. If you're out there doing an inspection, more than likely it is to generate um, a report for an insurance company or somebody to do their budget. It's not generally to generate income into your company. Anybody can do a roof inspection, a home services. So really, you don't need to be a roofer to do a roof inspection in that term so you don't want to be the roof inspection company you want to be the roof survey company where you're driving driving the whole mission you know you're assessing with as a real professional the whole purpose is that you're generating income for your company out of it and i don't necessarily mean you're charging for that survey a lot of times the strategy is not to charge for the survey it's to get the work that comes along with it so this is every company will have to make that decision but I can tell you in my experience, anytime I charge for a survey, I consider that an inspection. And that's usually somebody calling me up and say, hey, we're buying 20 buildings. We need each one inspected because we need a budget on them. That's an inspection in my mind. I'm gonna charge them per inspection, right? Now I wanna go out and yeah. survey your building is because I wanna generate a relationship with you. I want to be able to do your maintenance work. I wanna be there for your emergency repairs. And ultimately, I'd love to get you onto a maintenance agreement. That's why we're doing what we're doing. So you're going to be giving them a lot more things, an in-depth analysis of the project, where the roof is at, um, some matrices, um, short-term needs, long-term needs, mid-term needs. What I mean by that, short-term is anything that they know is going to have a problem on the next time it rains. That's more considered emergency. You need to alert them of that immediately. You know, your mid-term is something, hey, you might want to get this taken care of. It's probably going to be a problem six months down the road. And of course, you got your long-term maintenance. What I consider that to be is where you're getting into, I got a 10-year roof, it's into year seven or year five. Here's the things you need to do in year six, seven, eight, nine. So we're extending the life of this roof out another five years, you know, whatever you need. So you put them on a long-term plan. So that's more out there. Give them those choices so that they can look at. And would you kind of lump in, you know, we have roof inspections, we have roof surveys, and then we also have roof certifications where the contractor will go out, look at the roof and certify, yep, this is a good roof. Would you lump that in to the roof survey as well? Or would you consider that something different? Well, I consider that different. And I will absolutely say be very cautious on certifying anyone's roof. Um, <clears throat> on the home side, 
that's very a lot a lot of people you you can be a certifier and go out and give you know certification on it but on a commercial side uh, i know through my experience you need to be very cautious about this because if you're off on the date of that roof or you extend it i i've seen people's as i call feet held to the fire so you always want to kind of and i don't use the term wiggle room but you got to be realistic about it so just give them the actual uh you know the skinny on the roof what it looks like what it is your professional opinion is always the best i'm giving you my professional opinion to what's left in the life of this roof you know give or take a year or two either way yeah yeah so you and i have <laughs> talked about this before and and yet another hot topic in the roofing industry especially with covid 19 regulations which is technology everyone has had to adapt to a new technology age so what are some of the things that you are seeing that are helping contractors? Yeah, I mean, there's all nice software out there today. Um, you know, you know, just to kick a few out, you know, as I've heard people say in alphabetical words, always the best way of going. But, you know, we, we, we affinity partner with a lot of them and a lot of them we don't. But there, there's a lot good depending on what works. You know, you got Dataformer, you got Java, um, you know, you have, you know, Job Nimbus and you have Acculinks and a lot of other softwares that you can use you also have just regular crms that are made by other people that you can adapt through templates so um at when you get going there's no doubt the softwares make your job easier but anybody that's starting out don't necessarily think you have to there's nothing wrong with starting out easy and building simple templates into word or powerpoint it's a little more a little more legwork for you but you're not making a huge investment till you get your feet wet and say yeah I'm good at this, let's continue, now we'll start to grow. But regardless what you hand your customer, and that's why you see the legal disclaimer on here, what I mean yeah. by that is make sure somewhere in there it says that is your property to be used only for the customer to see what they can do with you, and this is not to be shared with anybody. Um, you know, on the, on the legal side, we'll be able to help you out, give you a solid one, but without putting the legal in there, put something in there to protect yourself. You don't wanna be the guy out there, the guy or lady out there doing the report, passing it around so you, everyone else is looking at yours to do the estimate. You want them to know that you're a professional, you value what you do, and this is only intended for you and the customer only. Um, some other tips in there, including your survey, you know, you want to show a typical roof conditions photo. So if you go out and you're looking at a roof curb or a vent pipe and it's bad, show a photo of what's wrong. Um, in these softwares, you can automatically mark them, but if you're doing it digitized into Word, Put a little arrow where it is point out what it is the more you can show your client the better they're going to understand what it is you want a roof drawing and, and sometimes we get a little crazy with these it doesn't necessarily need and i actually do not recommend this is just my opinion do not recommend giving them a full drawing with measurements that is such an easy thing to kick out there for everybody else to use to be able to give re-roof quotes i like to just put a simple drawing uh, you know, mark it out where the units are. You can draft it. You can, you know, handwrite whatever works for you, and mark these conditions in there. Written descriptions. When you're doing your invoicing or sending out your report, keep them simple. I know what used to drive me crazy is when you work with your service techs and they start to write a paragraph that everything is wrong. I will guarantee you your client will not read that. If you have an open lap on a seam, then it's an open lap on seam. Make it simple. Then when you show the after picture, you put down there that you did a repair based, whatever the repair was, but make it simple. Keep it in the shorter words is easy. That's easy to understand. Remember, they're not roofers and they don't want to be roofers. They just want to know you fixed their problem. Look at it as if you're at home and you're calling a plumber and you got a clogged sink. What's the really thing you want to know at the end? My sink is unclogged, right? You don't care what the chemicals were or any of that. Now, of course, in the breakout of your bill, some Clients are good with lump sum. Some are want very detailed. So you will have to get detailed on that part for what you use on your thing. Um, technology. I mean, right now today, if you only have a smartphone or a tablet, you're pretty much in business. You can take pictures of what you're doing. Videos. You know, a lot of people don't realize that a video overlay of the building as you're going around, you're going to educate your client exactly what they have. And I know we've got some other neat things to look at here in a minute on some of the other technologies. Yeah, we do. So if you had to create a toolbox um, for a roofing tech with some, you know, items in it for them to be successful, what are some things you'd put in it? Well, you definitely, um, you know, 
Okay, so when you if you're going, it depends on what you're doing, but you have to at least have the minimum repair tools to go do the work, right? Mm -hmm. So if your roof survey tech is going out and they're going to bring information back for the estimator or they are an estimator, you've got to be able to measure the roof. You want to be able to take a core cut. So they're going to need to have the patching to put it up there. And that's kind of one thing I want to say in core cuts. You need to let your you need to verify with your uh, client that you're going to take a cut out of the roof and just don't do it. Because I've seen roofers right. get into trouble on this by cutting it and patching it. And then the owner says, well, I never gave you permission to do that. So know your client up front what you got to do. But as far yeah. as that goes, if we get away from the roofing tools and all the basics that you need to do that, I mean, come on, you got to have a smartphone today. I mean, I, I always hear, well, I have roofers who are not very good with technology. I say bull on that. Every single one of them is home at night doing something on their cell phone, whether it's on Facebook, on LinkedIn, whatever it is, they're communicating. So you can get a lot of these softwares right on apps on the phones to do your reports right out there, do your measurements, do your pictures. So those are all important things to have. If you have the basics and a little bit of technology, you're well on your way. Absolutely. So we have another poll for our attendees now. And what we want to know uh, before we move forward is what technology do you currently use? Do you use drones? Do you have a CRM system? Do you use thermal or infrared cameras? Um, smart tablets. Some people are into virtual reality now. So uh, this part, you can actually mark as many as, as you want. If you use all five of those, go ahead and mark those. And I'll give you guys a couple seconds to do that. Okay, things are coming in. I'm going to close the polls here in three, two, one. Let's take wow, a look. These so, are some really good results. Absolutely. 80% of you guys use the CRM system. That is fantastic. Is that 48%? Again, I'm not wearing my glasses when I should. Yes, use that's drones. <laughs> Almost 50% use drones, 63 smart tablets, 5% virtual reality. That is so cool. That's fantastic. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of these technologies now. And the first one that we're going to start with um, are drones, John. And, and this is something that's obviously popping up everywhere within our industry, um, not only on the contractor side, but I know that insurance companies as well are starting to use drones because safety is becoming more and more paramount. So talk to me about drones and what kinds of efficiencies can be gained by using them. Yeah, I love drones. I think they're a fantastic tool. Yeah. Um, a couple, you know, with, with the drones, this happens to be a shot of one of our, uh, our office here in Tampa. You can see our sign. We took a nice drone shot. You know, you get some overviews. These are just still shots. But you have that video that comes allows you to do two things. You can have an overall video. I mean, you could take this drone and go right on down next to that unit, hover over it, take a picture. I mean, you literally could take the building owner right out with you into the parking lot because he doesn't want to climb a ladder. He doesn't want to get up on his roof. If you wanted to see it live, you could see it live. You could even show him, you know, your team up there working on it if you're trying to gain the trust of a new customer. So there's more than just taking pictures. A drone is a great tool. Um, you know, and yeah. then, you know, you can you can actually it's coming out. There, there's drone measurement tools coming out. A lot of companies are developing them. So I, I really think when we get a little bit further into you know the technology future, which seems to always get shorter and shorter, things coming out new, you're gonna see drones be as an important tool to our industry as it is just taking up your work tools, right? It's going to be like having a pair of work boots in the morning. You're going to take your drone with you. Um, you know, a couple other yeah. things other than just using a maintenance. I know we have a lot of commercial contractors out there. This is a great tool to check the safety on your projects. This is a great tool to check the quality of your projects and your production and efficiency. So I know we're here for service, but I just want to let you know that a drone is a good investment. And you can have only one person go around and do all your drone work. Even if it's ahead of your roof survey text, it doesn't necessarily need to be, uh, you know, different, you know, one person doing it all. So you can, you can variety, you know, break this up in a variety of ways. Yeah, sure. So the next thing I love is infrared. I think this is the coolest thing ever. 
which is probably super nerdy, but that's okay. So in my previous life as a contractor, I loved using the infrared camera um, to look at hot and cold spots on a roof, as well as help with interior leaks. So talk to me about infrared, because I know uh, that is pretty cool. It's coming out. A couple people on our webinar are using it now. So talk to me about it, John. Yeah, infrared. So this is just a basic shot to show you. Same shot without it, same shot with it. I actually did this through a drone. Um, yes, it was done during the day, so it's not, you know, we had, it just is just to get a demonstration out for, for our presentation. But what, yeah. what it will show you is it'll show you the hot spots. You, get the, you can see the colors on here. Um, it'll pick out the moisture in the area. It'll pick out where the leaks are going to. But more importantly, it's going to show your client that you're really, you know, you're going that extra mile. And it's not, this used to be an expensive process, not some more. So, okay, you don't have a drone, you're not to that deck. There's plenty of handheld infrareds that will be able to go and show the hotspots of leak. It's a great tool as far as not having in a drone. If you have the uh, tool itself, great to include them in with your service techs. Done this a lot recently. Put them out, have your service techs carry them. They're, it's easier to track the leaks. It gives them more of a, you know, where it's going and everything. Drones are cool, there's no doubt. Infrared drone is even cooler. So, for anybody that's tech nerdy, that's the way to go for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so I know that the FFA just came out with new regulations last week. So I definitely want you to talk a little bit about, you know, the drone identifications and what's going on there. Yeah. So, you know, you know, personal history of this start out, you know, when the drones first came out, pretty much anybody could go by, you send a card in, you got a drone. You know, everybody was taking pictures of people in the park and all over, and we start realizing there was a, you know, great commercial use for these. So then the FAA came out with a regulation you had to go take these tests, and uh, you know, I don't know if anybody's ever done that, but they're your equivalent. You can get a pilot license after taking one of these courses and getting your <laughs> drone license. But most importantly, before we get into changes, you need to realize that as a commercial, uh, when I say commercial, you're a business you don't want to have someone operating a drone that is not approved and has a you know license, a certificate to run these drones. You're putting yourself at risk if you do that because you're open to fines. And also too, I will tell you, I don't know if you've seen this yet um, out there in the audience, when it comes time for insurance renewals, they will ask you if you have a drone. And if you answer yes, which you should if you have one, the next question is going to be, is the person trained and certified to run this drone? If the answer should be yes, then you're probably not going to have any more issues other than that. If not, it could be a premium hike. It could be a lot of things or they could decline coverage of anything with the drone. So keep all that in mind. Now, recently, some of the changes are they've come out. So drones kind of work off of size and weight, and they have certain regulations that make you go get the test. They've now come out with drones that fall just underneath the FFA to uh, run where you don't need to go take this full pilot license, you just have to take a simple certificate course. That's actually probably very good for most contractors. Um, you may not have the full-fledged large drone that you're gonna eventually wanna get into for great marketing shots and all that, but you you know at least get you started without getting into the next picture of having someone certified. But definitely be very careful, drones are great, but be careful with them and make sure you got everybody trained on them. Yeah. So I had a, I just had a question come through about drones. Should you hire an outside drone photographer or train someone internally? Well, if you just want to do it for some simple marketing for your company and you want to be able to use that for promotional and you don't have somebody, you may be just as well to hire somebody that runs a drone service to come do, you know, whatever, a whole day shot with you. But if you want to get serious into these and start using them as a tool, like we talked about earlier, to be able to do your surveys, check on your quality, whatever you want to do, then the best way of going at that point is finding someone in your company that's at a level that you know you, you feel comfortable with, their long-term employee, get them trained, get them out there using it. It's always good to probably train two people. You always want to have a backup. Somebody's on vacation, somebody you know, moves on, so you're 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 well set. So it's a two answer to that question. So it depends on what you're doing. If it's just for marketing, you just want to get a few shots, it's probably cheaper than that to go ahead and just hire a marketing company to kind of give you a uh, range uh, for a really good drone um, without 
uh, uh, without infrared on it, you're probably anywhere from 1500 to 2500, 3500 max. You're going to get a super drone, really clear pictures, probably fly higher than you'll ever need and all that. Infrared's <laughs> usually between 500 and about a thousand dollar add on, and they can package them in, but you can get a really good drone with infrared for around 25 to 3500 dollars, just to kind of give you an idea. So they're not super expensive. Yeah. And as technology goes, it constantly comes down, right? <laughs> yeah, there's always something new and improved. So, yeah. we, you know, we, we've just talked about different types of technologies that have come out, but something I want to point out is that we're moving into this new type of economy, right? And we are, you know, it's, we were back in the early 90s, late 90s, um, this manufacturing based economy. And since then, it's, it's had a slow start uh, in the roofing industry. And now, like I said, we're moving into this new technology data-driven economy. So talk to me about data, John, because I know it's one of your favorite topics and you're such a data guy. So talk to me about what's going on with data in the future. Yeah, data, you know, in my mind, data tells you everything. Um, there's nothing you can't, unless you manipulate data, as long as you're truthful to data, data will be truthful to you. That's the easiest way I can say it. But data is absolutely a buzzword, and I'm mostly have heard it out there. Yeah. Data is a new oil of our digital economy. So when manufacturing, the Industrial Revolution, oil was the driver of that. Well, definitely data is the driver of what you know the new economy, and, and it's just a buzzword, the new economy. But it is where the phase is going. As we start to phase out, there'll always be manufacturing. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not talking about doing away with oil, green, nothing to do with that. This is just what drives the industry and data is what's driving everything today. You start, you probably started to see on TV more about, you know, cryptocurrency um, and all the stuff that's coming. You're starting to see that in construction. That's why you want to start digesting data now. You're probably going to see blockchain with all kinds of new uh, contracts, POs and money transfer. I know I'm getting a little off here, but I just want you to know the importance of data where it's going to. So you've only yeah. seen the beginning of it. So how, yeah. how does that transpire for you as the contractor going out and what you know want to do a service business? So there's nothing more important than the data that you capture, right? Every survey that you're going out and doing, you are capturing data on some client's building. You know the condition of the roof. You know the life expectancy of the roof. You know what's put on there. You know how many other repairs may have been made. Whatever it is, you now own that data, right? So you're going to keep that. And we saw we have a lot of people using CRMs, which is great. That's what you're storing in there. So you have already have that, right? You're putting that in there. So now the thing comes into, now that you have it, what do you do with it? Well, you have to manage it. By managing the data, you need to know how to analyze it, right? So now you've got the data, you're trying to get to the client through the report, what he needs to do on the roof, where it needs to go, repairs, the whole thing. You're giving them part of their data through analyzing it. So now what do you do with it at the end? Well, you now, if you got a customer with multiple buildings in, or even one with one building, you're able to give them a very good history of what they've spent, why they spent it, and what they need to spend. And then you get to take the time to educate them on how they extend the life of the roof, which I'm telling everybody on this call, your golden egg on this is getting into that preventative and extending of the life of the facility's roof. That's where you're giving the bang for the buck for your client and you're going to make the most money. But you're going to do that through data. And I will tell you very few clients that you learn to service well through the customer service process are going to leave you when you're one of the best roofers they've ever had. You fix their leaks, you give them great service, but more importantly, you own their data. They don't have this. They may have access to see it, but it's your data. You don't, if they decide to leave you, they're not entitled to take their data with them because you're gathering it for your use. So, you know, use it as a tool to continue to service your clients. I think it's very important. Yeah. So using, gathering that data, managing the data, analyzing the data, and then let's talk about dispersing the data now or how, how you can look at it and uh, make your company more efficient. Talk to me about the Smartsheet solution. 
so Smartsheet Solution is one of the solutions we use here. A lot of you know people use um, uh, different programs and different things. We prefer this. Just that's what we do. It, it's a it's easy. It's a reasonable solution for most contractors. But more importantly, you now have the data in front of you. So you're kind of getting an overview here. This shows you a little bit of everything, financial data, your project management results and all that. But well, let's just stick with the service side on this sheet right here. So you now have their data in, you know how much money they've spent, you, you know what leaks you've been out, how many times you've been out, you have this in front of you. So now you've got one of your customer service techs on the phone, you know, representatives on the phone with a the client. They have access to pull this up immediately and say, well, you were out here last week and you, you know I wasn't, we, last time we were on this building, was such and such a date and we worked on section four and they're like, oh, well, that's not what I was told. So you now have this in front of you, right? Makes mm -hmm. your customer service people, your service managers, everybody involved in the process now knows what the tech did, why they were out there. It's in front of them on their dashboard. Very important. And then once you get this, you also now look at it from your, you talked about stacking the pipeline for your re-roof. You now have a wealth of knowledge of what year these roofs are, when they're really going to be ready for a re-roof. You've already done your core cuts. You've done your surveys. You are ready to prepare a full estimate on this building you've been servicing for the last 10 years. So you can work with your client. It's right there in front of you, right? So you can kind of figure through this data. If you have a bar graph over here or a pie chart there, you can have how many roofs and how many square footage you're servicing and what year they're going to be due for a re-roof. So when you're doing your long-term five-year term five -year budgets of your company, you can look at your service division and know how many re-roof opportunities you've got coming up over the next five years through your service division. Absolutely gold. You talk talk about being able to make proper projections. This is gold. Absolutely. So now we have here another kind of service department dashboard specific, and you you touched on the service here, but talk to us about you know what these smart sheets can do for you with sales, pipeline, and things like that. Sure. What I like about this is this is a simple dashboard just put together for demonstrations. <clears throat> It'll show you the year to date compared to prior year. Um, what on the on the left on the right chart on the top you can see emergency leaks. You're able to tell the client now has access to this. Only the client can get into this and who you allow in. So you can allow if the client wants four people in their firm to get in here, you can give access to that and only those four can get it. Mm -hmm. So you can they can now get a picture of what's going on and what they're spending in emergency leaks a year, preventative maintenance, or uh, re-roofs. But the, what I like about Smartsheets is you have the ability, if they call you up tomorrow and say, hey, I need this chart, this is the way my, my new corporate wants me to manage my system here, you can change it overnight, right? So if you, you know, a lot of systems don't allow you to do that. So that's why I like this. This gives you a lot of manageability, but not just, putting a commercial in here for what we do with Smartsheets, regardless, whatever, if you have a CRM that has customer portal access, use it. Learn to use it with your clients. Learn to train them to get on it. Most of what I see out there is a lot of softwares have this ability, but the roofer fails to train the client how to access it and how to properly use it. So they're not getting that benefit. Again, what is your end game here? Your end game is to keep this client for life. Your end game is that you are that one-stop shop. You're going to give them their budgets. You're going to take care of their emergency leaks. You're going to repair when they need it. You're going to do preventative maintenance. And more importantly, when it comes time for a re-roof, they don't want to go anywhere else. They know they've already budgeted for your money because you've told them in year seven, your roof's going to cost $800,000. And you always have, and hopefully at that time, the prices, you're right on the money. And they're like, okay, we have a budget that we don't need to go out. So, you know, that's the end game. And it doesn't always work like that. A lot of companies require three bids. But the point I'm getting at is if you are their one-stop shop, you will at least get that last opportunity. To, to, and I always look about it, not about lowering price. That last opportunity is about getting apples to apples to see what someone else has proposed in the scope. And you'll be able to show, well, I've got more covered. This is why we're doing this. You'll win your bids. Yeah. You'll, win your, you'll win your roofs. Absolutely. So I have a, a question from an attendee um, that I want to throw out here right now because we're talking about the smart sheet solutions. And their question is, will smart sheets integrate with my CRM? Absolutely. Uh, the great thing about smart sheet is it was designed 
to work with your software. This is this can be a standalone for certain things, but this is a gatherer, this is a collaborator. That's what it's meant to do. So you're allowed to use your favorite accounting system. You're, you can use your favorite CRM. You can even use your estimating system. The, as long as that system is has an open API or an exportable uh, capability into a simple CSV file, which I will tell you if they're not open API, not going too deep into that, if it's open source, 80% of your software is already open source. Um, not so much push and pull, but it usually will push out. Yeah, and then I haven't yet come across any software that doesn't have an exportable capability into CSV. So as long as it's one of those two, yes, all that information can be brought out, put into here, and it allows you to collaborate with your clients, collaborate with your company, collaborate with your teammates, which is all three important collaboration tools, and gather your data from all these systems, put it into one spot, and analyze it and do something with it. That, and again, when I say do something with it, I mean actually assist you in managing and operating your company or your divisions. This is meant right on down the line. Yeah. Well, John, first of all, I want to thank you for letting me interview you today. Oh, my pleasure. Second you did a great all, job uh, today. <laughs> uh, we do have some other questions from attendees that I want to um, ask you. And, and any of the attendees, if you have other questions, please put them in the chat. We will uh, try and get to as many of them as possible. So the first question, John, is um, taking us back to uh, working with service and having different roof techs. And the question is, what is the benefit for the service side to filter crews to punch out and follow up on production roofs just finishing instead of concentrating on more service work? Well, that's a great question. So I've done this. Um, so the model here, if I'm understanding the question correctly, is you basically want to keep your production crews out there, putting down roofs, getting them down to where they're saying they're 100% complete, which usually is not the case. And rather than keep that crew there, you're going to move them on to the next job. And you've got a specialized crew that's probably sitting in your service or maintenance division. And they're going to be kind of your quality control. Um, quality control punch out crew. Yes, there are advantages to that. Some of the, there's a couple of advantages. One is you're not tying up a production crew. They're not sitting out there with six, eight people where you may only need two people for a day or a day and a half. And secondly, if you have a properly trained service division side that knows how to punch out roofs, knows how to get the quality up there, they'll get it done. You usually will have less callbacks and it's a great QC check onto your operation side of your business. So yes, that, that model does work. There's good ways of doing it. If you are going to do it that way, then that is a great time when you're done to get Mr. or Mrs. Owner up there and talk to them about a maintenance plan, um, you know, your maintenance agreements, how they need to manage their warranty, how you service it, what you can do for them. So if you're going to do that model, use it as a sales tool. It's a great one to do. Good. Um, so we have another question. You talked about data, and I'm curious about Cotney's AI precognitive analytics that I've heard about. What is that? All right. So precog analytics uh, is a program we designed through the Smartsheet uh, process. Um, what it does is we will come in and we'll work with you on capturing all your historical data. So whether it is in your accounting system or CRM, wherever. Uh, and we've we've worked with companies that have actually come out of paper files. That's a lot more work. Mm -hmm. Now, usually, you need to work with them on somebody actually getting this data entered into at least a spreadsheet form. But so let's just say we now have your data. The magic of this is getting it all put together into the system, and then it analyzes it through these formulas that we built. So the end result, what you'll get out of it, is, and what you would want to get out of it, is we can take your data. Be able to tell you anything if you want to know how many man hours per square it took to do a job what your historical profit is on the job all the normal stuff that you'd expect but where it goes to the next level we can take that based upon your historical abilities of your estimator your foreman uh, your superintendents whatever you have data tied to right whoever's tied to that data we can go ahead and say 
you know, you now have a filter coming in for the type of jobs you bid. So we now have job X, which is maybe let's say an EPDM job, and it is in such and such area. And, you know, we're going to bid it. It'll tell you based upon your historical data, which is the best estimator for closing and profit rate to assign to bid that job, right? Mm. It can also tell you if you have a sales team, which sales team has the best close ratio going out and taking that type of bid from that estimator and closing with that type of client. So we'll be able to take it to that level. And then the next step beyond that is, and this is really great for operation side, it can tell you which is your best foreman to put on the job, which may, but what by telling you that, what it gives you is that advanced look ahead if you, if you end up successfully selling this job, you can now look at your operational schedule and know if that foreman is available. And if they're not, you know that's the best foreman to put on that job. So you have a chance to manipulate and change your schedule around to put the best people on the projects that you have coming in. So, you know, when you get down to pinpointing to that, that's, that's some really good stuff. Yeah. Let's talk about technology, right? <laughs> And the bottom line to all this, one is what you're going to get is great customer service, right? Because you've already, that's why we call it pre-cog. Ahead of time, you've already given the client the best team to work with out of your company for their particular project. And then most importantly, you're putting the best team on it to install it. So your customer service level is high. But for that, besides that benefit for you as a company, you've got profit. You're going to increase your chances of making profit. You can predict where you're going to be. Yeah, absolutely. So, John, looks like we have time for probably one more question. Okay. And uh, a question that I received is, if setting up a service company for commercial roofing, what radius from the office should I cover or what radius should I market to? Well, you can, I mean, real, realistically, I would like to say that up to 60 miles radius is is probably serviceable within you know emergency repairs and within a day now that's not to say once you get beyond that growing you can service out beyond that because people will pay you for travel if you're their client but most people are not going to be willing to pay you past that and i you know just a rule of thumb usually 60 mile radius from where your shop is is a great coverage area to work off of that's great so I, I want to thank everybody who came to our webinar today. Hopefully you got something out of it. Um, John, if somebody has a follow-up question for you, how can they get in touch with you? They, well, they can call us at any time. They can email any of you or you can email me direct. I'm always happy. And my email is jkenny at cottonycl.com. Anytime we're here for you. That's fantastic. Any other words of advice you want to give our attendees real quick? Um, I just would say if you are existing in the service business, whatever you're doing now, you can do a lot better. Just get all your systems in place and you can increase even more and grow. Good growth is great. And if you're new into it, don't be afraid to get into it. Um, you know, start out slow, work your way up. I'm telling you this, especially with the economy that we're looking at going ahead and the new economy with digital and all the techniques and technology out there, this, it should be a valuable part of your, any business plan for a roofing contractor, for sure. Absolutely. Well, again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. Um, if you have any questions, get a hold of John or myself. And uh, again, we're always here to help. So thank you so much. And thank you, John, again, I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. You too. Thank you.